Hello, Phil258, uh, Life and Death students. This is a uh, Neil fight. You know, we used to be together in uh, Dodds Hall, room 102. Uh, we're going to try it this way for, uh, for a while. Hopefully, it'll work okay. Um, I have a little talk today on um, the meditations of uh, Rene Descartes and uh, an associated view of the mind and the body that we're going to talk about. Um, by the way, in addition to this video, I have uh, the slides that are going to be available for you, probably by the time you see this, are available for you. And there's a handout, handout 8, if anyone ever wants to take a look with uh, sort of the highlights, just the main points, kind of all there in one place. Um, this video today is going to um, basically be our class for uh, our Tuesday, March 24th class. <clears throat> and I'll make another little one for uh, for the, the Thursday class. So I hope everyone's okay. We're going to try our best to, to kind of do things this way. Um, we'll see. Hopefully it'll work out. There's a wonderful oil painting of uh, Rene Descartes. You could read a little bit about uh, some of his biographical highlights there. Um, Descartes was, was born in France and um, He's most well known for his uh, his book, The Meditations, which consists of of six meditations. I'll say a little bit about that from time to time. And uh, extremely influential philosopher, largely thought of as the you know the first Western modern philosopher. Um, also well known as a as a physical scientist. He had a sort of corpuscular or particle theory of uh, of um, the universe that was uh, very um, influential. Did important work in mathematics as well. You might have come across an x-axis and a y-axis, which are called Cartesian coordinates. Cartesian is uh, the adjective form of Descartes' name. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be thinking about these questions. What is the mind? And we'll take a look at Descartes' answer today. Um, how are the mind and body related? This question is essentially the, the mind-body problem, or, or the, uh, the problem of answering that question is the mind-body problem. Um, more generally, the idea to uh, account for the facts about the mind and the facts about the uh, about the physical universe and how they're related. And um, a closely related person is the question of uh, what is a person, which we're going to be focusing on. It's going to be good to have some concepts uh, in our sort of philosophical toolbox to, to think about these issues and try to answer those questions. You might remember that uh, we talked about vital fluid for a little bit. A lot of people think that we were talking about the idea of vital fluid because there really is no such thing. But um, vital fluid, if, if it exists, is supposed to be a substance. Okay? The idea of a substance is such a basic idea that it's, it's very hard to define, if not impossible to define in other terms. So here's just a rough definition. It's a being. It's a thing that can exist independently of other things. Um, it's a thing that has attributes or properties. Okay? So. Um, if you are holding a phone watching this video, your your phone is a substance. It's a it's a being. It has various attributes like um, its its weight and its size and stuff like that. Um, vital fluid, if it exists, is uh, supposed to be a, a non-physical substance. But we're going to talk a little bit deep about the idea of a physical substance. We're just going to call this a physical object. So this is a substance that has mass and takes up space or has extension. Okay. So um, even even an electron is going to be um, a physical object. It has a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of mass and uh, presumably takes up at least a little tiny, tiny bit of space. Okay. Um, the uh, shirt or sweater that you're wearing is another substance that has a greater mass and takes up a greater amount of space. Um, air, the air around us, is uh, a substance. Okay, the, the little particles, the molecules of the various uh, gases in the air are substances. We are going to um, use the concept of a soul or a Cartesian mind as well. So let's define a soul or a Cartesian mind. Remember. Cartesian is the adjective form of Descartes' name, to be a non-physical substance that can think or be conscious. Now, this is just a definition. So, we're going we're gonna to be talking about a debate between some philosophers who think that there are souls or Cartesian minds and others who don't. Um, so, but they're all agreeing on the concept. The concept of a soul or a Cartesian mind is the concept of a non-physical substance. So, the idea is that it has no mass. 
uh, takes up no space, does, doesn't exclude other objects from its space. Um, and, but nevertheless, it can, can think, it could feel, it could have sensations, and so on, be conscious. Okay. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the substance attribute distinction that we were talking about a little bit when we talked about life as a substance, but here's the definition of a physical property. It's a property that only a physical object could have. Now, you might think, oh, that's a circular definition. You can't define a physical property in terms of physical. Well, remember, we defined a physical object as an object that has mass and takes up space, and, you know, has extension. It's extended in space. So this definition really isn't circular. A physical property is a property that only something with mass and extension can have. Okay, so here are some examples. Anything that's red is guaranteed to be a physical object, right? You can't have, you can't be red without having a surface, you know, taking up a little space and therefore having some mass and so forth. Okay, so these properties, sometimes called attributes, are properties that only a physical object could have. Um, just to clarify things, if you're, uh, if you need a little bit, um, consider, suppose that someone is wearing a, a red sweater, okay? The red sweater would be the physical object. The redness of the sweater would be the physical property, okay? Or the or being red, the, the property of being red would be a, a physical property of that sweater. Now, in metaphysics, we can get into all sorts of fancy debates about um, are, how are properties real? Are they mind independent? And, but we don't really have to get into uh, so deeply into those sorts of debates. Um, we're going to distinguish physical properties from mental properties. So a mental property is a property that only a thinking thing or a conscious being could have. Okay, so if something has a mental property, it's guarante guaranteed to be a thinking thing or a conscious being. Um, being happy is a mental property. You can't be happy unless you're thinking or conscious, right? Feeling sad. Believing that pigs fly. Not many people believe that pigs fly, but anyone who does is guaranteed to be a thinking thing. Okay, um, what we're going to do basically this week is uh, talk about the bottom perspective here and then next week sort of the top perspective. Here's two general views on the mind-body problem. Um, materialism is the view that a person just is his or her body. So I am equal to my body, you are equal to your body. Okay, the, um, the word is has a couple of different senses in English. This is the sense of uh, identity, which we could um, also represent with the equal sign of math. Okay, um, A person is identical to his or her body. A person and her body are, are the very same object, according to materialism. And materialists typically think that the mind is the brain. Uh, uh, the brain is a very special physical part of the body. So the body here is just the whole body, including all the organs, including the brain and stuff like that. So the idea here is that our brains have mental properties. Um, you know, we have mental properties in virtue fundamentally of our brains having them. Dualism, on the other hand, is that a person is a compound object of body and soul, hence the dualism. Um, so the person is sort of partly, partly physical, partly non-physical. And that the mind here is the soul, um, which is kind of why we're going to call this a Cartesian mind, the mind as Descartes thought of it. Okay. Um, if you did the reading, you know, um, which is sort of selections from Descartes' meditations, we have some selections from the first, second, and sixth meditations, and then a, a letter to Descartes by a, a woman named Princess Elizabeth in our reading for this week. Um, this view sort of emerges as we go a along through the meditations. I'm going to present this as the combination of, of three general claims. Okay, so here's the first claim of Cartesian dualism. Claim A. Each person is a mixed substance composed of a body and a soul, or Cartesian mind. So the idea here is a mixed substance is a substance with parts from different categories. So we, we are partly physical, the body, and all the parts of the body, but we are partly non-physical, uh, the mind. And these parts can exist independently. Um, most dualists think that uh, after the death of the body, the mind continues to exist. There are some dualists, some, some people in fact read Descartes in this way, you know, the idea here is that a person is, is a mixed substance, so you're, no, you're not just a soul, you're not just a body. Um, some people read Descartes as um, 
saying that a person really is just a soul that is sort of temporarily connected to a body. So if you want to think about that as a, a, a closely related version of dualism. Um, but even on Descartes' view, when we are a mixed substance, um, you could continue to exist uh, without your body. You could continue to exist after losing your body. Um, you might compare. You ever clip your fingernails? If you clip your fingernails, you now continue. You lose some parts. You lose the tips of your fingernails. Okay. God forbid, I hope this never happens to anyone. You, you might lose a finger or something in a, an, a, an accident. Um, you could lose, you, you could continue to exist without your finger. Um, on this view, you could continue to exist with, not only without your finger, but w without your whole physical body. Okay, um, Just as you could con continue to exist without just a little part of your body. Okay. Um, what about uh, the relationship between mind and body? So here's the idea. A person's mental properties are primarily properties of that person's Cartesian mind. So if you think or feel or imagine, uh, it's really fundamentally your mind having those attributes of, of feeling and thinking and imagining. Um, on Descartes' view, a purely physical body, even with a brain, even with a functioning brain, could not think or be conscious. And finally, um, part of the mind-body problem was to answer the question about the relationship or the connection between the mind on the one hand and the body on the other and the physical world more generally. The idea here is that it's a, it's a direct causal relationship. So there's a two-way causal interaction between the mind and body. And this explains human action, which is causation in the direction from the mind to the body, and perception, which is causation in the direction from the body to the mind. And I'll explain that just sort of briefly. When you act, you first um, decide or choose to do something, right? You choose maybe to, I don't know, open your refrigerator. Um, and then you go to the refrigerator and move your arm and you open it. So the idea here is um, some event taking place in your mind, a decision or a choice, causes your body to move in certain ways. Likewise, um, when we see things or hear things, this is causal interaction in the other direction. Um, light enters your eye, you know, light stimulates your retina of your eye, your optic nerve um, fires, and um, things then happen in your mind. Your mind forms a mental image of something, uh, looks whatever you're looking at. That's body to mind causation. Okay, so the mind and body are directly causally connected according to Cartesian dualism. Um, Descartes thought that the locus of this interaction was in a certain gland that's called the pineal gland. I'm you know, not so sure that science kind of backs him up on this, but the pineal gland is a gland kind of right in the center of the brain, probably why he thought that this is where the locus of interaction is um, between the two hemispheres of the brain. And um, Descartes thought that um, when you make a choice, sort of the, the first physical effects of your of the mental choice are going to occur here in the pineal gland. And likewise, when, uh, when you see something and the light hits your eyes, blah, 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 the, the last physical causes of your mind forming a mental image, a visual image of something, um, occur in the pineal gland here. Okay. Um, what we're going to do for the rest of this video is think about a couple of arguments that Descartes gives for basically a dualist conclusion. Maybe they don't establish all three claims of Cartesian dualism, but um, some arguments that kind of establish a general dualist perspective. Um, here's a little quotation from our reading. Um, I think that Descartes wrote the meditations in Latin first. Here's our one English translation. Um, I am not that structure of limbs which is called a human body. Uh, this is actually Descartes' conclusion here. He's stating his conclusion first. He, basically, he's saying, I'm not a body. I'm not my body. He says, I'm not even some thin vapor which permeates the limbs, a wind, fire, air, breath, or whatever I depict in my, imagin in my imagination. For these are things which I have supposed to be nothing, that is, doubted. I've doubted these things. Let this supposition stand. For all that, I am still something. I'm going to be fairly quick about this, but um, I don't know how clear this is at, 
upon reading the meditations, um, if you haven't ever read them before. But at the beginning of the meditations, Descartes' goal is to, essentially it's to put human knowledge on a firm foundation. And he starts off with a, a particular methodology, often called the, his method of doubt. What he does is he doubts everything that he formerly believed. Um, and then he's going to see if he can reconstruct anything. He can see if, if there's anything immune from doubt. And um, so, you know, Descartes, when he wrote the meditations, he was sitting in some room and he was looking at a fire. I think he had a fire going in his fireplace. And um, he's, he said, I'm going to doubt that there's really a fire there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suppose that it doesn't exist. And he gave various reasons for these. So um, he says, well, sometimes I've been deceived by my senses. You know, I, I thought I saw something, but it really wasn't there. There are optical illusions and hallucinations and things like that. Well, maybe he's hallucinating his fire. Okay. Um, and then he's thinking, well, you know, it's it seems so real, this fire just doesn't seem like a hallucination. And then he he imagines another sort of skeptical scenario. What if I'm dreaming? You know, in dreams, I've often been convinced that I was walking around, um, looking at things. Uh, maybe I'm dreaming right now. I can't rule out that possibility. And um, then he gives an even more far-fetched, or I don't know about far-fetched, but an even more extreme skeptical hypothesis that he's being deceived by a godlike evil demon or evil genius. And the idea is maybe he's just sort of a disembodied mind and this evil, evil because it, it's intent on deceiving people, godlike but evil uh, being is just kind of filling his mind with sensations and thoughts, um, kind of like our experience machine that we were talking about when we were talking about hedonism. Um, and Descartes is thinking, okay, I could, I, I could doubt. I'm, I, now I'm even doubting that I even have a body, right? Not a, let alone that, a, that I'm sitting in a room with a fire. I'm doubting that I even have a body. But just wait, I'm, I'm still having all these thoughts, these doubts, these sensations. I can't doubt those, so I'm still something. Okay, I can't doubt the fact that I'm thinking. Um, Descartes' famous phrase, uh, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, doesn't occur in the meditations. It occurs in another one of his works, but it is very much sort of um, at the central uh, heart of, of the matter here. Okay, so in any case, that was uh, Descartes' project here in the meditations, and he's got an argument for dualism here based upon it. In a nutshell, the idea is, I cannot doubt my own existence. I'm certain of the fact that I'm thinking. There's got to be a thinker. Cannot doubt that. But I can doubt my body's existence. So I'm not my body, you know? My body is doubtable. I'm not. I'm not the same thing as my body. Um, it's kind of a striking little argument. Um, the argument occurs in another one of Descartes' works, um, his so-called uh, Discourse on Method. I'll just read that for like a minute in my lovely voice. I, attentive, I attentively examined what I was, and, as I observed, that I could suppose that I had no body, and that there was no world nor any place in which I might be, but that I could not therefore suppose that I was not, and that, on the contrary, from the very circumstance that I thought to doubt the truth of other things, it most clearly and certainly followed that I was, and I was in the sense of I existed. And then he's concluding that, uh, that his, his essence or nature consists only in thinking. The, the idea is that um, his only essential qualities are the qualities of being capable of thinking. Okay, what I would like to do is present to you a sort of a valid, formally valid version of Descartes' argument and kind of go through that and, and give you a little bit of a challenge to it. Okay, so I have premise one that I'm going to separate into two parts, a part A and a part B. Descartes can, can doubt the existence of his body. That's kind of what I was just sort of explaining with his, um, his method of doubt. But he found out that he cannot doubt his own existence. He could imagine a scenario in which uh, he's being deceived into thinking that he actually has a body, some extreme virtual reality scenario. But he couldn't doubt that he was, in fact, uh, the experiencer of all these thoughts and sensations and feelings. If that's the case, premise two basically says, if part A and part B of premise one are, is true, it, so if premise one is true, then Descartes is not identical with his body. Um, the reasoning there is that um, 
his body has a quality that he doesn't have, basically. His body is doubtable, but he isn't, right? And they cannot therefore be the same thing. But if he's not identical with his body, premise three, then dualism is true. Okay. Well, if he's not identical with his body, then materialism is de- definitely false. I mean, according to materialism, each of us is the very same thing as, as his or her body, and then some, some version of dualism has got to be true, so therefore dualism is true. Okay, I don't know what you're thinking right now, you know, is something fishy going on, but I'm going to have us review the explanations for these premises, and I'm, I'm going to be pretty quick about it. Obviously, you can pause this video, watch it again. Okay. Um, premise one, explaining it. By the way, explaining a premise is not just saying what it says, it's giving some reason to believe it. Um, some of you on your midterms did great. Some of you could have done a little bit better on that. Um, part A of, of premise one says that Descartes can doubt the existence of his body. So he doubted everything that he could, which included the existence of his body. You know, he couldn't rule out the possibility that he was being deceived into thinking that he had a body, that that um, his sensations as of having a body were really false sensations in a certain sense. Part B says that he can't doubt his own existence. This is the I think, therefore I am. He could not doubt the fact that he was thinking, and from this it logically follows that he exists. Okay. Um, What about, oh, by the way, um, we talked about the experience machine for a little bit. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the brain in a vat thought experiment, but it's very similar. Um, the idea here is a, a super duper um, neurophysiologist or neuroscientist or some, could, could connect electrodes to a brain from a very powerful supercomputer and stimulate the brain in such a way as to give it experiences as of um, you know, inhabiting a body, walking around, dealing with other people, and um, reading books and uh, drinking, stuff like that. Um, when all the while it was sort of in this vat, kind of like an experience machine, um, in a in a vat. Um, so all of all of its beliefs about the world turned out to be false. Okay, Descartes' uh, evil demon thought experiment kind of kicks this up a notch when there, there's not even a, a physical brain in existence. Okay, and by the way. Um, The body here includes all the parts of the body, okay? Um, Premise 2, I'll remind you what premise 2 says. It says, if premise 1 is true, in other words, if he can doubt his body but he can't doubt himself, then he's not identical with his body. He's not the very same thing as his body. This comes from a... um, doctrine that's often called Leibniz's Law. Gottfried Leibniz was another philosopher who um, lived a little bit after Descartes uh, did. Um, if thing X has a property that thing Y doesn't have, then X is not identical with Y. X is not equal to Y. That's what Leibniz's Law says. Okay. If we let X be Descartes' body, which is doubtable, and Y be Descartes himself, whatever he is, which is not doubtable, and the property of being doubtable, we get the truth of premise one. So according to premise one, Descartes' body is doubtable by him. He can doubt the existence of his body. But Descartes, thing Y, is not doubtable by him. So Descartes' body has the property of being doubtable by him that his that himself doesn't have, that he himself does not have. So they can't be the very same thing. Um, Leibniz's law is definitely true. I, I don't want you to doubt Leibniz's law. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Carol and Vanessa. They're friends. Um, they're meeting for coffee one day, maybe after social distancing is closed. And um, they're each talking to the other about their new boyfriend. Okay? Carol says, oh, I'm dating a nice guy named Steve. Vanessa says, wow, I just met a guy named Steve. We, we've been dating. Carol says, huh, that's unusual. My Steve is um, six feet tall with blonde hair. Vanessa says, oh my, my Steve is uh, six feet tall with, with blonde hair. Ooh, gee. They get they begin to get worried. Carol says, oh, my Steve, uh, he, he likes to wear um, suspenders. Vanessa says, gee, that's weird. My Steve wears suspenders too. They become very worried that they're dating the same guy. But then, luckily, they discover upon conversation that the Steve that Carol is dating stutters. But the Steve that boy, um, the Steve that uh, Vanessa is is dating does not stutter, and they conclude, oh, thank goodness, 
we're not dating the same guy. Carol's boyfriend is not identical to Vanessa's boyfriend. The equal sign with a slash through it is the they're different boyfriends, they're different objects, right? If one person stutters but another person doesn't, they're definitely not the not they're not the same thing. If one thing in my pocket is blue and another thing in my pocket is not blue, they're not the same thing. Okay? Okay. So if Descartes' body is doubtable and he, he himself is not, they're not the same thing. That's Leibniz's law. Premise 3 says if Descartes is not identical with his body, then dualism is true. Okay? Here's sort of a the general line of reasoning. Okay? Well, if if he's not identical with his body, materialism must be false. So dualism is the only other viable option. And um, you know, Descartes was a special guy, but what goes for him goes for all people. You know, we, we could all engage in Descartes' method of doubt. So, you know, if Descartes is not identical to his body, then I'm not identical to mine, and you're not identical to yours. So, we're either not bodies at all, or more than bodies. So, some, this, some sort of evidence here is for, for Cartesian dualism. Okay. Um, with every argument, almost every argument, there's a, a pro and a con. So, I'd like to run through an objection to Descartes' argument. And we're not going to get too detailed in this class. Um, some of you probably recognize this person. It's not, uh, it's not Madonna. Um, some of you maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, that person was Marilyn Monroe, a famous um, actress from the, well, I don't know, 50s and 60s. Many of you have probably heard of her. You, uh, hey, if you're near your parents or whatever, uncles, you could go ask them if they've heard of Marilyn Monroe. Um, but fewer people have heard of Norma Jean Baker. Okay, I'm saying, hey, if we poll people, more than half of them are going to have heard of Ma Marilyn Monroe, but almost none of them are going to have heard of Norma Jean Baker. Okay, so Marilyn Mo Monroe is famous, but Norma Jean is not famous. Okay, and uh, if that's the case, then they're not the same woman. Norma Jean Baker is not identical, not equal to Marilyn Monroe. That's Leibniz's law, right? Marilyn Monroe has the property of being famous. Norma Jean Baker does not have that property, so they're not the same person. So therefore, they're not identical. Okay. This kind of reasoning, I'm calling it a parody. Parody is making fun of something. Um, is intended to uh, poke a hole in Descartes' argument from doubt, or show that something is wrong with it, because this conclusion is wrong. Okay. In fact, Norma Jean Baker is Marilyn Monroe. That picture that I showed you of Marilyn Monroe was a picture of Norma Jean Baker. They are one and the same person with two different names. Okay. So, um, reasoning with Leibniz's law is is complicated and subtle, um, but. This parody, you know, you, you can't prove that Norma Jean Baker is not Marilyn Monroe because they are the very same person. This does, I think, cast some doubt on Descartes' argument from doubt, that maybe something has gone wrong somewhere with that argument um, to prove that Descartes is not just his body, even though it might be hard to say exactly what went wrong with it. Um, if there's a fallacy here, it's one that is sometimes called the masked man fallacy. Um, I'm the guy thinking, have you seen my dad? There's that guy in the mask, okay? Um, I, don't, I don't know this, but that is my dad, okay? Um, it's just my dad. I can't recognize him in the mask. That's a pretty serious mask, right? Um, so I might doubt that the masked man is, is kind and gentle, but I, I don't doubt that my dad is kind and gentle. I can't conclude that the masked man is not my dad, okay? Because the masked man is my dad in the mask. I just don't know it. Okay. So... Um, Leibniz's law reasoning is is tough and, and complicated when we're when we're talking about our um, our attitudes towards things, you know, doubting them or or, or knowing them, like being famous. Um, so this kind of casts some doubt. the The argument, um, I know my my dad is kind and gentle, but I don't know that that man is kind and gentle. Can't prove to you that my dad is not that man because he is. Okay. I want to lay one more argument on you as we finish up this video. Um, on page 8 of our reading, this is from the sixth meditation, um, Descartes says this, 
simply by knowing that I exist, and seeing at the same time that absolutely nothing else belongs to my nature or essence except that I am a thinking thing, I can infer correctly that my essence consists solely in the fact that I am a thinking thing. It's true that I may have, or to anticipate, I certainly have a body that is very closely conjoined to me. By the way, in the end, Descartes doesn't doubt the existence of his body. It, it's a long and winding path. You could read the meditations if you have some months off. Actually, it's not that long. You could read it probably in an evening. Um, but by the end of the meditations, Descartes is convinced that physical bodies exist and that you know we, we can know most of what we believe about the world around us. Um, so by the end of the meditations, he has sort of found a way to resolve his doubts. For him, it involved a the, the existence of a, of a god who was not a deceiver. But nevertheless, on the one hand, I have a clear and distinct idea of myself, insofar as I'm simply a thinking, non-extended thing. And on the other, I have a distinct idea of body, insofar as this is simply an extended, non-thinking thing. And accordingly, it's certain that I'm really distinct from my body and can exist without it. Okay, so he's giving a dualistic conclusion there, right? He seems to be saying that he's got some reasons for arguing that he's distinct from his body and can exist without it. And this is a difficult passage, and um, if I had more space on this slide, I would have included some other stuff. The stuff that comes before it is also kind of helpful here. Okay. Um, here's an argument, and, you know, I'm, I'm taking a long time, but I'm going to go through this for a couple of minutes and then kind of wrap up. Um, Descartes is thinking, premise one, I can conceive or imagine myself existing without a body. His evil demon thought experiment, you know, he, was, he was thinking, hey, not only am I a bodiless brain in a vat, I'm just sort of a disembodied mind with sensations and beliefs being kind of pumped into it. Um, you might imagine yourself looking into a mirror and seeing your feet disappear and seeing your, um, your mid-section disappear and then seeing your whole body disappear and then seeing the, what was behind you in the mirror. Right? We can conceive of ourselves you know, existing without a body. Imagine this. Premise 2 says, if premise 1 is true, if I can conceive of this, then it's possible for me to exist without having a body. The idea here is, in general, what we can kind of clearly and distinctly conceive of is, a, is at least possible. Okay. Hey, I can conceive of um, go, being skiing right now, uh, even though even though it's not that that doesn't mean that I really am skiing right now. All that means is it, it's possible. Okay, it doesn't have to be actual; it's at least possible. Okay, but premise three continues. This is just a big long modus ponens. If it's possible for me to exist without having a body, then I'm not essentially a physical body. Um, you are essentially something when you can't exist without being that way. Okay, um, so if if it is possible to exist without having a body, it's not essential to you to have a physical body. That that's premise three is hypothetical. It's clearly true. Um, by the way, if it's possible for me to exist without sitting, then I'm not essentially a seated being, right? Okay. Premise four says if I'm not essentially a physical body, then I simply am not my body. Um, I think that this premise is true. Um, a physical body is essentially a physical body, right? Your body could not fail to be a body, right? Your, your physical body um, could not exist without being a physical body. You know, maybe it could be a little smaller, it could be a little larger, but, but your body, the thing that is your body, could not exist without being a body, without being a physical thing. Um, so, if I'm not essentially a physical body, then I'm not my body because my body is essentially a physical body. Therefore, I'm not my body. Okay. Um, the reading assignment for uh, next week is a little essay by yours truly, where I'll give you some some stuff to think about. Um, you know, we, we might ask if we could, you know, hey, some of you might might think that this argument is an awesome, sound argument for this conclusion. Some of you might be uh, doubtful even if you agree with that conclusion. You know, you we might doubt whether this is, it's really correct that we can conceive of ourselves existing without a body. Or maybe premise two is the more, um, I don't know, 
dubious premise here. Uh, maybe not everything that's conceivable really is possible. Maybe some things we can imagine are really not even possible. Um, not not just not even the, really the case or actual, but not even possible at all. Um, probably someone who really wants to object to Descartes here might might focus in their their critical attention on premise two. Okay, in my next video, we're going to talk about some objections to uh, Cartesian dualism, including an, an objection from a uh, female philosopher from the um, 17th century, Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia.